Hello, everyone. I'm John Corstein, uh, Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center here at the Mariner's Museum at Park. And today I'm going to be able to tell you one, uh, I think, one of the most important stories of the Civil War. However, it's so overlooked that um, people don't recognize just how smart McClellan was in devising these combined operations. You've got to remember, George Brinton McClellan, of course, is called to Washington to become commander of the Army of the Potomac, and then he become his name general in chief of the U.S. Army. Um, he basically went to uh, Sevastopol uh, during the Crimean War and was part of the uh, three authors of what's called the Delafield Report, which Delafield. Um, Alfred Mordecai and George B. McClellan. What they did is understand how um, war of movement now meant moving up and down people's coast. It's not like the grand battles of Napoleon. Instead, it's trying to interdict your force in between the forces of the enemy. Uh, and your mobility will then be able to supply that force and will be able to break the enemy's um, how could I say, their communication links and supply links. And the Confederacy had a major problem at the beginning of the war because it had 3,000 miles of coastline to defend. As a result of that, um, they were just simply unable to effectively defend the entire coastline. And so uh, basically, um, you know, the Union started their combined operations really in the east with the capture of Hatteras Inlet, which we'll talk more about, and then with their capture of Port Royal Sound. Uh, now, what made this expedition so important uh, was that uh, it was going to strike at the very heart of the Confederacy, because the inland seas, as we call all the North Carolina sounds, um, are, are so important. In fact, when the Federals captured uh, Hatteras Inlet, everyone was frantic in North Carolina. The sad thing is the people in Virginia weren't quite as frantic as the governor of North Carolina and various commanders who uh, tried to defend uh, the Great Inland Sea. So basically the Great Inland Sea um, is key. The key to them all is Roanoke Island. Roanoke Island is uh, 38 miles above uh, Hatteras Inlet. Uh, there's two sounds that go around it, Roanoke Sound and Croatan Sound. Uh, I have to say that Croatan Sound is the one that's primarily used, very narrow, but it makes a link between Albemarle Sound and Currituck Sound. And Currituck Sound and Albemarle Sound, guess what? They all link directly to Virginia via the Great Dismal Swamp Canal and the Albemarle and Chesapeake Canal. Um, this makes it very, very important. And on those shores of the northern part of the sounds uh, would be key cities uh, such as Edenton, uh, Elizabeth City, uh, and, and so they are targets for the Federals. Now, you have to realize that once you, if you go south from Roanoke Island, you end up in Pamlico Sound. And Pamlico Sound is going to give you the, the huge city uh, at that time of New Bern. And also, it's going to link you to Core Sound, which then links you to uh, Bogue Sound. And that's where uh, yet another important town is located, uh, known as Beaufort, North Carolina. So these important port cities. Now, also, um, the rivers that fed the sounds like the Noose um, uh, and uh, Roanoke River and so forth, they go to where the railroads, those rivers, go to where the railroad, as one person said, the Great Southern Railway, uh, because it has links from um, uh, Richmond all the way down to Savannah. Uh, then it also has links that go across from Charleston 
to, of course, Corinth and Memphis. And so the Confederate railway system is not as effective as the Northern, but if you capture a town like, I just say, uh, uh, you know, um, Edenton, you're on the way, you can take gunboats up and actually cut the railroads. And so that's a story we'll talk about later. Um, but this deep, th this railroad connection is critical. And so are the canal connections because estimated four fifths of the food used by Norfolk uh, during the uh, one year the Confederates controlled Norfolk uh, came from Eastern North Carolina. So it's this rich agricultural area. It's a transportation system, a riverine and then canals and then also railroads. So I have to tell you, you know, after the capture of Hatteras Inlet, whoopsie, uh, there we go. Uh, almost forgot, you can see at the top, um, here is, uh, get this right. Currituck Sound, um, and there is the um, Albemarle and Chesapeake Canal. Um, many people in Virginia call it the Chesapeake and Albemarle Canal. In North Carolina, they call it Albemarle and Chesapeake Canal. Anyway, so here's the great Albemarle Sound. You can see the Pasquank River um, that's going to lead you to the Dismal Swamp Canal, and voila, there you're at Portsmouth in Norfolk perhaps one of the most important industrial, especially naval industrial centers in the South. It is the finest, uh, the Gosport Navy Yard, the finest military or naval um, shipyard in the entire South. So as you come down, you can see Croatan Sound. That's the main one with the deepest channel. Roanoke is there, but it's very narrow. And then you get into the largest of the sounds. And this is, of course, Pamlico Sound. And you can see as you're following my uh, or my cursor, core sound, and then that empties into um, what is called bug sound. Uh, and so that's the end of the sounds. This is one third of the wealth of North Carolina. This is one third of actually the population, one third of the land area. This is a critical place and the most critical spot of it all is right here, Roanoke Island. Um, so the capture of Hatteras Inlet is going to shock uh, the, the North Carolinians in a major way. Uh, actually, then governor of North Carolina, Henry T. Clark, will plead with Jefferson Davis to send more military support for coastal Carolina. Um, they thought, now Davis, in turn, you know, he went to West Point. He thought he was the smartest military person in the Confederacy. And so, you know, he thought that the place to really confront the uh, Union armies in the East was in Virginia. And he uh, did not recognize that the mobility of the sounds, um, actually everything about the sounds, is a place where Roanoke Island, as one person said, should have been made, uh, actually this is Henry Alexander Wise, should have been made the Gibraltar of the South because of its tremendous strategic importance. Now, um, so uh, no one after Hatteras Inlet is really paying attention to uh, North Carolina. Um, so basically we are gonna have a series of people that are going to work on um, the, uh, the way to defend the key to it all, and that is, as you see, Roanoke Island. Now, um, <clears throat> Clark, Governor Clark, actually is so upset with the Davis administration that he'll write a letter to then Secretary of War, Judah Benjamin, saying, besides the arms sent to Virginia in the hands of our volunteers, we have sent to Virginia 13,500 stands of arms, and we are now out of arms, and our soul, soil invaded, and you refuse our request to send us back some of our own armed regiments to defend us. We have disarmed ourselves to arm you. The recent invasion, Hatteras Inlet, 
compels us again to buy a Navy for our own protection, not receiving it from the Confederate States. We are denied powder on the ground we have see, received more than any other state without advertising that the powder that is, has been received has been made into cartridges and sent back to Virginia uh, with every regiment. So North Carolina, in essence, is left virtually defenseless. So basically uh, what the Davis administration decides to do is they're gonna send down um, a officer from North Carolina, uh, Richard Caswell Gatlin. Now, uh, Richard Caswell was a hero of the uh, Revolutionary War in North Carolina and a governor, wartime governor, North Carolina. Uh, Gatlin's a descendant of him. Um, now, he was assigned on July 8th, uh, 1861, as the Department of North Carolina Commander. Um, he was an 1832 USMA graduate, fought in the Mexican War, and was a member of Albert Sidney Johnson's Utah Expedition. Heavily criticized for the loss of Hatteras Inlet in August, Gatlin moved his headquarters to Goldsboro, uh, but he did not get any more troops. He was assigned other generals because he tried to departmentalize the defense of Eastern North Carolina. Um, Brigadier General Joseph Reed Anderson was given command of the Cape Fear District um, with a brigade of troops. Anderson, of course, 1836 West Point graduate. Um, he actually is the owner of Tredegar Iron Works, which is ever so important in terms of the defense or production of arms for the Confederacy. Now, on the sounds themselves, they will place Daniel Harvey Hill in command. Now, Harvey Hill, or D.H. Hill, as he's commonly known, is an 1842 graduate of West Point, a hero of the Mexican War. He resigned his commission, first to teach at Washington College, now Washington Lee in Virginia. Then he goes down and is um, uh, going to take become a professor at Davison College. His father-in-law becomes president. Um, it's a good Presbyterian school. Um, of course, Daniel Harvey Hill has a acerbic wit about him. And so, uh, in fact, my favorite story about him is that Hill um, is, uh, of course, um, as a professor at uh, Davidson College, he will be in charge of buying textbooks. And he considers that terrible because all the textbooks are built, are written and published where? In the North. So he writes his own book called Elements of Algebra um, for Southern Southerns. And uh, so, and it has these word questions in it. You know, I think uh, my favorite is when a, a, uh, a Connecticut Yankee goes from uh, uh, New York down to Beaufort, North Carolina, with a dozen apples that he bought at eight cents a piece. And he sells those apples for 13 cents a piece in Beaufort. How much money did the Connecticut Yankee steal from the Southerns? Uh, so anyway, he was actually uh, uh, superintendent of the North Carolina Military Institute. He fought at the first land battle of the Civil War, known as the Battle of Big Bethel, June 10, 1861. Uh, he is an outstanding officer, recklessly brave, well loved by his soldiers. However, he was abrasive and outspoken. And so uh, he goes down to North Carolina and he will take some time. I don't want to talk about him yet. He will take some time. He knows that Roanoke Island is the key to the sounds, but he takes a 15 day. Uh, inspection um, of uh, the defenses of Eastern North Carolina, and he will write, uh, uh, Judah Benjamin, this report. Fort Macon has but four guns of long range, and these are badly supplied with ammunition. New Bern has a tolerable battery, tolerable battery, two eight-inch Columbiads, two 32-pounders. It is, however, badly supplied with powder. 
Roanoke Island is the key to one third of North Carolina and whose occupation by the enemy would enable him to reach the great railroad from Richmond to New Orleans. Four additional regiments are absolutely indispensable for the protection of this island. The batteries also need four rifled cannons. The towns of Elizabeth City, Edenton, Plymouth, and Williamston will all be taken should Roanoke be captured or passed. Well, Hill will actually go to work building this defensive line right here. Uh, this is, uh, there's one road leading up from Ashby Harbor, which was where the Union forces will land. And it goes up this, it's called a cart path. Um, and so the Confederates have actually built a 80 foot long earthwork right there. Uh, the trouble is they don't extend it to the their flanks because these swamps over here and over here were considered impassable. So anyway, uh, Hill uh, is going to be, uh, uh, after he starts that earthwork, he's going to be sent uh, back to Virginia and his district is going to be divided in two, which is terrible because the Southern District, Pamlico Sound, will be placed under the command of Lawrence uh, O'Brien Branch, who's a politician, no military service prior to the war. Um, and uh, then uh, they place uh, this man, Henry Alexander Wise, in command of the northern part. The trouble is, Branch reports to Gatlin, and Wise has to report to Benjamin Hugi of uh, North. Uh, of um, <clears throat> who's commander of the Department of Norfolk. And the rationale was at the canals, but actually this divided command structure is not going to work very well to allow the Confederates to have a mobile uh, defense system. Um, you know, I have to say that um, uh, the commander of the Department of Norfolk, some people say he's a little too senile at this time, uh, but he does not recognize the importance of Roanoke Island. He only sees that the Federals are going to attack Norfolk and Portsmouth by way of Hampton Roads and the Elizabeth River. Consequently, that's where he puts all of his resources, batteries at Sewell's Point, Tanner's Creek, Pig Point, Craney Island, and he also has almost 15,000 men. But when Wise asks for reinforcements, uh, the thing is, is that Huji will say, I don't have any to spare. And uh, so that's pretty terrible. Now, Wise was from the Eastern Shore of Virginia. Um, he was a lawyer. He served in the US House of Representatives for almost 10 years. He then was minister to Brazil. And according to Wise himself, his greatest achievement was him being governor of the great Commonwealth of Virginia. So, but he recognized, now he has no military service, but he recognizes the strategic importance of Roanoke Island. And so, uh, as Huji or Hugi, it depends on, it's not Hugger, it's uh, Hugi, um, uh, but his name is spelled Hugger. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I think the biggest thing is, uh, Hugger is an ordinance, or Hushi, excuse me, is an ordinance officer, graduate of West Point, class of 1825. Uh, he had served with distinction um, in uh, the Mexican War as chief of artillery for Winsco Winfield Scott's army. And so he actually received a dress sword from the state of South Carolina in recognition of the honor his career has cast upon his native state. Now, uh, Hugi is going to be a major general. Um, now, I have to tell you, Hugi is ignoring North Carolina. Finally, however, uh, a message gets through to Stephen Russell Mallory, the Secretary of Navy uh, for the Confederacy, and he will send um, 242 cannons from Gosport Navy Yard down to North Carolina. Now, these cannons all have to be used at Roanoke Island, Defense of New Bern, 
reinforcing the artillery at Fort Macon and other smaller batteries. So it sounds like a lot of cannons, but there was a lot of territory uh, to control. And so uh, basically, um, once they have those cannons, then um, Wise will complete the fortifications of Roanoke Island. Now, um, even though the access to Roanoke Island is really made through um, what's called Port Ashby or Ashby Harbor, uh, depends on who you are, uh, basically um, they're going to uh, build several forts. Um, the center redoubt is going to be 80 feet long, set at right angles to the cart road or road. And um, uh, the redoubt uh, was actually armed with uh, one 24 pounder, one 18 pounder, and then one six pounder, which was considered by Wise a relic of ancient wars, but nevertheless. Um, so the main fort on the island is gonna be known as Fort Bartow. Um, it's gonna be sited on Pork Point um, and it will have nine 32 pounder smooth bores. Um, now, fortunately at Fort Bartow, the artillery is commanded by brother-in-law to uh, Admiral David Glasgow Farragut, Benjamin Loyal, uh, who joins the Confederate Navy. He's from Norfolk. His sister um, met Farragut. His, his sister is Farragut's second wife. Um, so basically, um, there'll be two other earthworks uh, um, are going to be constructed, um, Fort Banchard and Fort Huyi. Um, They're all mound at where Fort Hugui at Weir's Point is going to have 10 32-pounders and 10 32-pounder rifles. But where it's going to be located is too far north. I'm not going to talk about him yet. Um, now, basically, uh, they also build, they get two um, old canal barges, and they push them up on the mud banks across from Fort Bartow, which they name it Fort Forest in honor of French Forest, the commander of Gosport Navy Yard. And uh, it will actually um, have seven 32 pounders and they're um, in parapet. In other words, they don't are not protected by earth. They're gonna be protected by cotton bales and hay. So anyway, that will establish a crossfire if the, the if Roanoke Island is going to be attacked by sea, which is the only way to do it. So then they also have um, um, Wise had organized what was known as Wise's Legion. Uh, he had taken it out to West Virginia. Uh, he had a feud with John Floyd, also a former governor of Virginia. And the end result is Wise is sent to North Carolina. He brings with him two of his regiments, the 46th and 49th Virginia regiments. And they're very well armed and equipped. North Carolina had to reform new regiments um, so that they could um, actually effectively man the fortifications at Roanoke Island. Now I have to tell you, the commander of the um, 8th uh, North Carolina um, is going to be a man known as Henry Shaw. Now, Henry Shaw is a doctor, medical doctor, went to University of Pennsylvania Medical School. He's actually a northerner who moved to Indian Town, North Carolina to start his practice. That town is now known as Shawborough. In fact, his home still stands. It's called the Twin House. So anyway, um, basically, um, he adds to his command elements of the 2nd and 17th uh, North Carolina regiments. And uh, so these were newly organized, poorly trained. Um, many were armed with shotguns, fouling pieces, and small game rifles. The artillery crews were infantry manned the week before and did not know a ramrod from a lanyard. And it was noted after Roanoke Island is captured, um, that uh, basically uh, uh, the men on the island, that's how they describe some of the Confederate soldiers. The prisoners were a motley set, all clothed 
I can hardly say uniformed, in dirty looking homespun gray cloth. I should think every man's suit was cut from a design of his own and no two men dressed alike. Their head covering was in unison with the rest of their rig, from stovepipe hats to coonskin caps. So, um, and added to this, uh, the Confederate Navy is going to be involved, and the commander of what will be called the North Carolina Squadron, actually they refer to it as the Mosquito Fleet, will be a famous explorer known as William Lynch, Flag Officer William Lynch, um, explored the Dead Sea and the Jordan River, wrote a book about it, and he actually proved that the Dead Sea was below sea level. Uh, so he's a brilliant explorer, a uh, fairly good combat leader, but a bad administrator. Nevertheless, he is considered a true gentleman in all respects. So, you know, he will, uh, of course, uh, when the war breaks out, he joins the Confederacy. He is in command of the Kula Creek Creek batteries and then comes down to North Carolina. He is going to put together, um, actually General Wise said this about him. Captain Lynch was energetic, zealous, and active, but he gave too much consequence entirely to his fleet of gunboats, which hindered the transportation of piles, lumber, forage, supplies of all kinds, and of troops by taking away the steam tugs and converting them into perfectly imbecile gunboats. Oh my gosh. So we're going to have a series of gunboats. Uh, there's Shaw. Um, there's Roanoke Island once again. Uh, you can see where uh, Fort, uh, um, there's uh, Fort Bartow, Fort Blanchard, and Fort Hoogie. Um, and then you can see Fort um, Forrest over here, which is going to be able to fire, provide fire support for all three forts. These two forts are too far away from the action. They will build a series of piles and sunken ships right here to block this part of the channels. So nevertheless, uh, whoops. Um, and so um, I did something wrong there, I think. Um, um, okay. So there is William Lynch, um, and here is, uh, this is the Fanny, um, which is going to be captured by the Curlew, Raleigh, and Unaluska, which will later be dropped from the um, squadron because of bad engines. So on the eve of the Battle of Roanoke Island, the Confederates will have the CSS Curlew, um, armed with a 32-pounder and a 12-pounder, uh, the CSS Ellis which is an iron screw steamer. Um, this has one 32 pounder and well, 12 pounder howitzer. It gets repetitive here. The Beaufort um, has one 32 pounder rifle. Um, and actually the Beaufort is commanded by one of the more outstanding uh, uh, officers in the Confederate Navy, uh, Lieutenant William um, H. Parker. And so uh, Parker is, uh, then there's also the CSS Raleigh, which is another uh, tugboat. Um, the Forest, uh, which uh, was uh, a worn out screw tug uh, built in 1851. Uh, and then there was the CSS Appomattox, which was built in Philadelphia. It's going to be commanded by an outstanding officer known as Lieutenant Charles Carroll Sims. Then there's the Black Warrior, which is actually a schooner built in Plymouth, North Carolina, and it is armed with two 32-pounders. So you can see none of these ships are armed well. They capture the Fanny at uh, Loggerhead Inlet, uh, which was a small little engagement. They were trying to resupply um, Union uh, forces at uh, Hatteras Inlet. And so the small, uh, they, their one victory is going to be right here. Um, it's actually on October uh, the 1st, uh, but it doesn't appear in Harper's Weekly until the 19th. There is William uh, Havar Parker, um, uh, who formerly was in the U.S. Navy. Now, let's talk about the Union. Um, oh my gosh, uh, there's so much to talk about in this uh, story. So anyway, uh, the Blockade uh, Strategy Board felt that combined coastal operations were the key. And so, uh, it just so happens as they're prompting 
expeditions against Port Royal Sound. Brigadier General Ambrose, Ambrose Everett Burnside uh, will actually um, go to McClellan, who's his friend. You see, Burnside was, of course, uh, a graduate of West Point, uh, but he had retired from the Army, and he has 1847 West Point graduate, he retired from the Army to go into business because he invented what's known as the Burnside um, carbine, which um, are highly collectible still today. There's a couple of different versions. It was a breech loading carbine that gave it this great advantage, even invented his own style um, um, cartridge. And so, you know, he's real brilliant. However, who wants to buy carbines during peacetime? Not the government. And so he goes bankrupt. McClellan gives him a job at the Illinois Central uh, railway and he actually becomes treasurer of uh, that railroad and so it is um, they're really palsy and so Burnside is going to go to him and say look I want to go up to New England and recruit fishermen and sailors and dock workers and watermen and the like into a coastal division <coughs> he calls it a coastal division because it is uh, planned to operate at first, he thought, in the Chesapeake Bay, but because of McClellan's plans leading towards the Peninsula Campaign, he will actually be given the task by McClellan of moving against Roanoke Island. Now, he recruits a 12,000 man. Um, uh, division. Um, his first division is commanded by Brigadier General John Gray Foster, who's a 46 graduate of West Point. The second brigade is going to be commanded by Jesse Lee Reno, um, who is a 46 graduate of West Point. And he, he received note uh, for his gallant and meritorious conduct during the battles that led to the capture of um, Roanoke. Um, uh, or Mexico City. Um, the third um, one is going to be uh, a man known as John Grubb Park, uh, Park, and that's spelled with an E. He actually went to University of Pennsylvania and then went to West Point, where he graduated in 49. Now, I got to tell you, all these guys are friends of Burnside and Burnside's friends with them. So they're able to put together a very good mobile force and um, and so, which will be divided into three brigades, as we said. Now, Burnside also goes out, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and buys transports. Um, he buys 67 transports, but he also buys a couple of gunboats because he said, well, we can't trust the Navy to really provide us the adequate support. This is a divided combined operation as a result of that. Uh, this man, Louis Malchibrez Goldsborough uh, is <clears throat> the commander of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron. Now, he had a pretty good career. He was commander, uh, captain of the state uh, ship of the line Ohio during the Mexican War. He had been superintendent at the United States Naval Academy. He had been commander of the Brazil Squadron. And so he will be named a flag officer in command of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron. And he starts to put together a special fleet that can operate within the sounds of North Carolina. And uh, you, I didn't finish my blog for today, which I will finish next Monday, but all these ships are detailed in, about you know their makers and so forth. But he's got ships like uh, the... Uh, um, Philadelphia, which is flagship, the Southfield, which is going to have, uh, could make 12 knots and could also have pretty powerful armament of three nine inch shell guns. Uh, the Hunchback is another um, former New York ferry boat, um, which is uh, going to have two nine inch Dahlgrens and one hundred pounder Parrot gun. The Commodore Perry um, will have actually 
two nine inch shell guns and two 32 pounders. Um, so basically um, he has 19 ships with a total of 57 guns, uh, a lot different than what Lynch has. Now, <clears throat> Burnside uh, will get his transports into Hampton Roads. They then go up to Annapolis and where they'll load all the supplies and materials they need. Um, and Goldsboro uh, tells Burnside, I will meet you at Hatteras Inlet. So, um, Burnside is given uh, objectives by uh, George McClellan, and they read as such um, that Burnside, in cooperation with Flag Officer Goldsboro, were to cap was to capture sounds like New Bern, the the sounds and cities like New Bern, Edenton, and Elizabeth City, capture or destroy Fort Macon on Bogue Bank near Beaufort, North Carolina. Um, uh, also destroy the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad at Goldsboro. And he knew those canals and railroads were key to the survival of the Confederacy. So he said, once you've got all those things done, then you can march on Raleigh if you wish, or go capture Wilmington. I'll leave it to your discretion. Well, Burnside will, of course, uh, now. Burnside invented the Burnside carbine. He also popularized sideburns. And uh, that's where you get sideburns comes from Burnside. Okay, so um, I think everyone knew that. Um, so anyway, so he will leave Hampton Roads, uh, will organize everything in Hampton Roads 5 January. They will eventually on 11 January leave the Chesapeake Bay heading down the coast. Now, it just so happens that they run into a terrible storm that lasts from the 13th to the 15th of January. Many of these ships, Burnside doesn't know anything about ships, but he's buying them from some slicksters in New York. So they have a lot of problems. And several, um, the, the scale is so bad that um, the city of New York will run aground with um, uh, its entire cargo of guns, ammunition, and almost 200,000 worth of supplies. The weather was so bad that they also, uh, you know, they couldn't rescue those people off the city of New York for 40 hours. The gunboat Zouave, the army gunboat Zouave disappeared without a trace. And so did uh, a floating battery, uh, which was being towed. Um, and then uh, the transport Pocahontas with uh, um, 100 horses disappeared without a trace. So this is a really uh, terrible storm. Um, so they finally get to Hatteras Inlet. Another storm strikes them when Goldsboro shows up. However, the real problem is crossing the bar because, you know, the, the Hatteras Inlet has some deep point parts, but also has shallow parts at high tide, only seven and a half feet. All the ships that Burnside buys are gonna need 10 feet water, so forth. And so this becomes a real issue. So the heavier transports unload their material at uh, Hatteras Inlet, and then they try to work all these other ships across the bar. They do uh, some by caking, um, which is throwing an anchor out and then pulling it in with the capstan and then repeating the thing again uh, with rowboats actually pulling. Sometimes they back up a ship at full speed speed into the sandbar and then tugs with the propeller churning will push the ship through. They dig their own channel in essence. And so finally, the, they all get into uh, the Pamlico Sound on February 5th, um, 1862. Now, so um, basically what happens is that uh, um, the, the Federals will move to the southern part of Roanoke Island. Uh, there's John G. Foster, Jesse Reno, uh, John Park. Uh, this is one of the gunboats that was purchased. Uh, the, uh, or the US Navy also purchased all these vessels uh, to turn into gunboats to operate in shallow Confederate rivers and so forth. This is the 
Herzl, uh, then this is the Philadelphia um, and USS Delaware, which is the flagship. Um, the Valley Cities in front of this larger hulk. Uh, this is actually a receiving ship uh, behind us uh, and uh, or behind the Valley City. Um, now the, the, there's Burnside during the storm and he uh, transferred himself into this small gunboat called uh, the Picket. And I know he wished he hadn't because the Picket was badly beat up during the storm, but he made himself so visible to kind of calm the, all the troops um, from fearing uh, what could happen uh, during the ship. So um, basically, I have to tell you that uh, the CSS Acomatic Appomattox, excuse me, uh, comes down on the uh, evening of 6 February. The Union fleet is divided into two different divisions, one to support the landing at Ashby Harbor, the other to deal with the Mosquito fleet. So the um, Appomattox uh, will uh, observe and then uh, Charles uh, Carroll Sims will report to Lynch. It just so happens that then Lieutenant Parker comes on board. Lynch and Parker are devotees of, um, you know, books like uh, Ivanhoe, Sir Walter Scott. And so they actually discussed about, you know, wow, they really have a, the almost impossible task the next morning. Um, and they knew their prospects were dim. Uh, however, all of a sudden they started to talk about um, Ivanhoe and telling which scenes were their favorite in each chapter and so forth. They're just going at it. They talk until midnight. And then as Lynch take escorts Parker to uh, a ship's boat to go back to his vessel, the Beaufort, um, actually Parker will later comment that um, Lynch says, ah, if we could only hope for success, but come again when you can. And as Parker was rowing back, he said, what strangely constituted beings we are after all. Here were two men looking forward to death in less than 24 hours, death, comma, two in defeat, not in victory, and yet able to lose themselves in works of fiction. Uh, you know, that's in his uh, book that he published after the Civil War. So the attack's going to begin um, at 9.30 on the morning of 7 February. There was bad weather that slowed the attack. So basically, um, Goldsboro will switch his uh, flag to the USS Southfield. He hoists a message, right, a signal that says, our country expects every man to do his duty. Stole that from Nelson, of course. And so they begin to uh, uh, shell to, or move towards uh, Fort Bartow while the USS Underwriter tries to clear out anybody defending Ashby Harbor, no one's there, uh, or no one is noted. And so the um, underwriter is going to move against the Mosquito fleet. I gotta tell you, they maintained behind the obstructions. Their guns did not have the range of the guns of the US Navy. Uh, so they're in pretty serious trouble. The soft field uh, will send a shell that goes through the upper deck, all the way through the hull, the bottom of the ship, and the curlew starts sinking. It's commanded by a man known as Lieutenant Thomas Tornado Hunter. And he's a crazy guy, gets real excited by battle. And actually, uh, he, he during part of the battle, he doesn't have his pants on. And he, he doesn't even know what happened to him. He's so excited. But when his, shell, his ship is shelled and holed, he tries to run it aground. The trouble is he runs it aground right in front of Fort Forrest so that Fort Forrest cannot participate in the um, counter battery fire against the U.S. Navy. So the gunboats really focus on Fort Bartow. Um, they will actually, um, thanks to Lieutenant Benjamin Loyal, 
that battery is well served. They actually will have 27 hits on um, various Union gunboats. The USS Commodore Perry received eight hits, three below the waterline. Burtzel was knocked out of action by a shot between the wind and water, and the hunchback was struck eight times. The Valley City actually had a shell go through the um, shell room, or through the upper works, down through the shell room and into a locker where it exploded next to the powder magazine. Uh, so um, the gunner of the ship, John Davis, actually sits calmly on a powder barrel and keeping the flames away from the powder room. That took a lot. Now, um, Fort Bartow maintained accurate and effective counterfire, and uh, but besides that, the Federals still are able to land their troops uh, at uh, Ashby Harbor. Now, there were some Confederates in the woods. Um, it was uh, actually Colonel uh, J.V. Jordan with 20 marksmen and two cannon. Jordan did not allow his men to fire, even though they have an opportunity to shoot at these guys in the, in the, in the ship's boats heading towards shore. Uh, he holds fire. And then uh, Captain or Commander Stephen Rowan of the USS Delaware will see the glint of bayonets. How many times is that told? But it, he will send um, grape shot and canister into the woods. Jordan retreats. And so, you know, that ends February 7th. On the next morning at dawn, the first brigade uh, commanded by General, um, um, now you can see this is um, basically Fort Blanchard. This is not really to scale in any way. No ship that big uh, made it over the bar right there. But nonetheless, they're able to stop and destroy part of the Mosquito Fleet. And this is Fort Blanchard right here in this make-believe drawing. Uh, there's the interior of uh, Fort um, Bartow. Um, now, the Union Navy thought they were doing a great job, but there are only four people wounded. Uh, I think uh, you see about eight or 10 wounded or something uh, in this picture. Uh, of course, it's uh, uh, incorrect, but um, the earthworks are damaged, but they're easily repaired uh, for the morning of February 8th. So, Foster's 1st Brigade will lead ahead. Now, the big problem for the Confederates is that Henry Wise has caught pneumonia and he goes to um, his sick bed at Nags Head Hotel. So he's not there to command any of the troops and the command is devolves upon Henry Shaw. One person said about Henry Shaw, that he was not worth the shot and ball to kill him, uh, the powder and shot to kill him. Um, and so that means he's not very good. Well, he concentrates 400 men in the central readout, and which is uh, going to basically um, uh, is protected by these swamps, which they said were impenetrable. Uh, the locals said, oh, if you sent a cow in there, you just don't go get it because you can't. It's all this muck and so forth. Well, I have to tell you that um, the uh, uh, federals will decide that, well, maybe we should try to go through the swamp. The second brigade commanded by Reno will move again the Confederate right through the swamps using the sec uh 21st Massachusetts, the 51st New York, and the 9th New York, known commonly as the, uh, there's Burnside again. Uh, here's our forts and everything. You can see the central readout right there. Uh, there are marshes to these sides. And so both Foster and Reno will take advantage of these and send their men through these marshes. The Confederates only have a few skirmishers out there because they're told no one can get through them. So what's going to happen is, is that they break through and uh, um, basically uh, several regiments claim to capture the uh, uh, fort, especially the 9th New York commanded by this very wealthy New Yorker, Rush Hawkins. He actually marries into the Brown family fortune uh, and uh, guys that 
created uh, around the university. So anyway, Hawkins men will break through the swamps of the great call, zoo, 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 and they will make it to the earthwork. Now, basically though, the 10th Connecticut had actually gotten there before them. And so, but Rush Hawkins, uh, this is the scene. Um, and you can see that uh, because of PR, they're given to the, the as that they won the battle, but they did not. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, that will be an argument that's later. Now, what's going to happen is that the Confederate, now Roanoke Island, once that forward defensive line is, is breached, Shaw surrenders. He surrenders all the other forts. And so Lynch will go back up to the Pasatank River um, and uh, try to make some type of defense. The Federals are going to want to destroy the Mosquito Fleet. And as a result of that, they will uh, basically move up the Pasatank River. Uh, this is Elizabeth City in the background. Um, this is supposedly the Mosquito Fleet. Um, however, they didn't have that many ships. But uh, basically, the defense, uh, you can see Pasatank River right up here is the entrance to the Dismal Swamp Canal. So the Federals on February 10th will move up. Now, basically what um, Lynch has done is that there's a four gun battery right here manned by militiamen. And so Lynch decides to anchor the Black Warrior, which is a schooner, um, right off the battery so that they can combine a, a total of six guns to try and stop the Union fleet. Now, remember the Union have the Hunchback, the Commodore Perry, the Valley City, <coughs> several major uh, gunboats. And so basically the guys in the Confederate battery all run away at the site of the Union fleet. So Parker has to take men from the Beaufort and go to man the battery. Now, basically, Lynch puts his ships in a line from Cobb's Point, uh, which the Seabird, the Ellis, the Appomattox, the Beaufort, and the Fanny. The Raleigh has been sent up the Dismal Swamp Canal to get more ammunition. Both fleets are low on ammunition, but they don't all know the other's problems. So Rowan basically says, look, you know, we, we, we have seven shots per gun. So instead of trying to outgun these, we're gonna steam right past Cobb's point, And then we're going to um, dash, as he calls, he has a signal that's called dash at the enemy. And so when he raises that signal within one uh, mile of this position, the Federals will uh, go full steam. They pass the battery. The Black Warrior is hit by a couple of shells. The, it's abandoned by its crew and set on fire. Uh, so the Commodore Perry approaches the Seabird, the next in line, and it will ram it, splitting the Seabird in two. It sinks. The Saris grappled with the U, uh, CSS Ellis. Grappling hooks, they board old style Navy stuff, you know, and they board the Ellis most of the men of the Ellis will escape. However, its commander, uh, James W. Cook, he'll be famous a little later in another story, uh, will actually use cutlasses to try and stop the borders and, and pistols. He will be gravely wounded. And so the Ellis is captured. The Beaufort sees all this going on. So it escapes up the Dismal Swamp Canal and the Appomattox follows it, but the Appomattox is two inches too wide to get through the South Mill locks, and it is forced to be sunk as an obstruction to the entrance to the Dismal Swamp Canal. So in basically, um, one, uh, well, from February 7 through February 10, three days, all of Northern Eastern North Carolina will be conquered by the Federals. 
They are going to be able to block the Chesapeake and Albemarle Canal. Well, it's actually the Albemarle and Chesapeake uh, Canal. They're able to control the entrance to the Dismal Swamp Canal. Um, they now have access to, of course, anywhere they want to go. So they capture towns like Edenton, Winton, Williamston, but they don't go as far as the railroads. But the control of this part of the um, North Carolina Sounds is going to be tremendous because it gives them the tremendous advantage. This takes away all the food supplies for Norfolk. This isolates Norfolk even more. And Hugi should have sent reinforcements, but did not. And as a result of that, the back door to Richmond has been left very open. So uh, basically Burnside now becomes famous because he has won these great victories at minimum cost using very modern uh, concepts of uh, combined operations and mobile warfare that he is going to be able to uh, control the Northern North Carolina sounds which is disaster for the Confederacy. As Wise said, his one of his son will be mortally wounded uh, during the battle at Fort, uh, at the Central Earthwork. Um, and so he says, uh, this loss is a disaster, a disaster in command, a disaster in leadership of the government and disaster for the future control of North Carolina and Norfolk. And he is very true with that. So that's my story, uh, the Battle of Roanoke Island. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can also email me or you can uh, uh, basically ask for some other topics. You know, it's a big story um, once again, and my blog will be published uh, early next week uh, so that all the ships I mentioned are going to be detailed and the concepts and so forth. And I just didn't write well this week. I don't know what was wrong with me. Uh, so, uh, but it's going to be a very big blog, probably about eight or 9,000 words. So uh, um, with too many footnotes, but anyway, uh, so what questions might you have? John, we do have have a couple. Um, Steve wonders, how was Wise regarded as a military leader? Not well. Um, more bombastic. Uh, however, he um, will serve all the way to the end of the war. He surrenders at Appomattox. And after the war, he will actually um, become a Republican. Uh, he says the greatest thing the Civil War did was end slavery because he recognized uh, the evils of slavery. Of course, he was a big slave owner before the war. But uh, um, so Wise <clears throat> uh, could, I mean, he did well at the Battle of the Crater. Um, he did well uh, at a couple other battles around Petersburg. Um, but he is not one of those outstanding leaders, but uh, he is a motivator of men. That's one thing we can say, but not a strategic or tactical genius. Well, and isn't, isn't Wise Virginia and University of Virginia at Wise, they're named for him, yes? Wise family, yes. Yeah. And actually, when you cross the Chesapeake, um, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, uh, when you get to Fisherman's Island, that's called Wise's Point. Okay. And Alexander Wise was born not too far from there. That was all their property. Um, and he was born at Drummondville, um, Virginia, which I don't think you'll know that when you pass it. Um, so anyway. <laughs> now, since this is a Civil War lecture, I have to say what happened 156 years ago today? What is today's date? Lee surrendered. On the ninth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't even know what day it was. Yeah. And so that's quite correct. Uh, it's also um, right when the bat Battle of Roanoke Island has just ended. I was a little too focused on that. And that's oh, actually nice. in February. But today, yes, is the anniversary of Lee's uh, capitulation at Appomattox. And if you all haven't been there, it's a, just an amazing site to visit. 
Oh, absolutely. Um, and you had just mentioned somebody's wise his son was killed. Um, yeah, John Drummond Wise. So that's what made me think of yeah. Appomattox. But um, Alex is asking, you mentioned Burnside brought ships for the army. Was the money coming from the army's budget and yes. how did these ships remain in the army or did they for future operations? They were leased. Most of the transports were leased. And so once they had done that job, then they, uh, you know, McClellan um, leased uh, so many ships during the Peninsula campaign that it cost the federal government $57,000 a day to pay for all the leased ships. Oh, wow. So now the gunboats, um, would be transferred to the Navy. Um, and uh, um, th th it's a very strange situation because, you know, out um, when I talked about Fort Donaldson and Fort Henry, uh, in essence, the Western gunboat flotilla was paid for by the Army and only captained by U.S. Navy officers at first because the Navy said, oh, we're too busy, you know, with the blockade. And then they took that uh, flotilla over. And um, fortunately, the commander of the flotilla eventually was David Dixon Porter. And he worked very well with the army, except for the incompetent Nathaniel Banks, which I'll tell that story someday. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. John Paul, nice for you to be with us today. He's asking, how did the Union troops outflank the redoubt, waiting or in small boats? waiting they did not carry any boats with them so basically they said they were sink in bogs up to their waist um and of course um basically you know these swamps now shaw you know the people said local said oh you can't go through that and so shaw said okay you know he didn't investigate it himself he and so he, as I think I said, he was not worth the shot and powder to kill him, uh, you know, so uh, he dies later um, in the Civil War, uh, but uh, he uh, is just not a famous officer in any way. So that loss of their flank, see what he did is he had 1,400 men, he put 400 in that forward readout, he's got... Um, 200 manning those other forts. And so he has a strategic reserve of about a thousand men. Now, the problem is he puts them 250 yards behind the redoubt uh, or the central earthwork so that when the Federals break through the flank, they cannot respond effectively. And that means that uh, uh, Shaw, when he sees that happen, he just surrenders. He doesn't try to organize uh, any type of defense, um, and uh, which is a, uh, um, you know, just it loses one of the most strategic places in the Confederacy. Just remember, Roanoke Island drives a dagger at the very heart of the Confederacy, it railroads, can canals, and also its agricultural resources. That is devastating for the Confederacy. Well, and the whole thing of, of the canal being blocked, I just thought of the Suez Canal disaster for the world. And I mean, it, this one had a real impact on, on the South and North Carolina, didn't it? Well, yes, it did. Um, the S Confederates block uh, South Mills Lock um, with the, the sinking of the Appomattox, speaking of the anniversary today. Mm -hmm. um, and then the underwriter uh, commanded by William Jeffers, who's actually right there. Um, he later becomes commander of the Monitor, but he will get an old dredge barge that the Confederates had left behind, and he sinks that at the entrance to, not under orders, but in the entrance to the Ch uh, Albemarle and Chesapeake Canal. That's a big mistake, because when you get into that canal, that canal is 14 miles long, and you end up in the eastern branch of the Elizabeth River. That means Norfolk could have fallen as early as the um, probably the 20th, 
or maybe the 28th of February with enough gunboats. Hugi does not have any landward side defenses. So they could have walked in there and there had been no great battle of the ironclads. And I would not be, you know, uh, director emeritus of the USS Monitor Center as a result of that. So they, they that, that's the big sad story if you're a unionist that you miss this even greater opportunity to actually force your way to cut those railroads and to actually use those canals because all the gunboats the union had were all small draft. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so they were quite capable of moving up the canals. So they had the troops available, they had the ships available, but they just didn't do it. Burnside instead uh, is, follows his orders and goes against New Bern instead of against Norfolk. And the rest is history. So Well, on April 23rd, we're going to continue this discussion with from New Bern to Beaufort. So yes. please, please join us for that at noon on the 23rd. A couple of more comments, though. Um, we love to discover family connections through our maritime heritage. And a shout out today to Robert and Norma Worden for joining us and yes. to Jerry Runyon. And Jerry, his great grandfather was at Morris Runyon, was at Roanoke Island. And I'm going to use that as a segue to Elizabeth's question. How many books have you written, John? So Me? your recent one with a with a Runyon, you could mm -hmm. speak to and then answer Elizabeth's question. Okay, well, I've written 20 books. Uh, the, you know, uh, the last one I published um, was using the um, remembrances of Jerry Runyon's father, um, who was Harry Runyon, who served as a uh, um, engineering officer for a uh, observation, aerial observation um, uh, squadron uh, during World War II. And so Jerry came to me and says, well, you know, uh, what can you do to make this into a book? And I said, oh, you know, and so uh, uh, I did that. And uh, Harry's uh, so War. It's called Harry's War. Um, and uh, it's a fun book. Uh, it uh, has some unique insights. I mean, Harry Runyon, you know, here he is. Um, a aviation engineer. Well, he ends up working on the space shuttle, the Apollo spacecraft. I mean, he has a PhD in aviation engineering or something like that. So uh, he uh, uh, actually offered, I mean, when he's in Europe, he actually comes across jet engines broken apart by, or it's just sitting there in hangars that they capture. And so he has his mechanics taken apart. So he kind of looks at how it worked and lo and behold, what does he do? He starts working uh, for NASA building even better jet engines. I, I couldn't help but um, give, give um, your latest book a plug. And, and how oh, many of your books have I edited, John? Um, the number is too great to count. <laughs> <Let's see>. so, <laughs> I think so about just, 10. Yeah, um, we just had to um, get that in. But yeah, yeah. Ed is asking, is there a book you could recommend on the Burnside campaign? <clears throat> well, if you just want the naval aspects, I would go to Robert Browning's, used to be chief uh, historian for the uh, U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, he wrote a book called The North Atlantic Blockading Squadron from Cape Charles to Cape Fear. And if you wanna know about the naval aspects, that's perhaps the best book. Um, Richard Trotter uh, wrote a book um, called Columbia, Ironclads and Columbiads, um, which is about the war in Eastern North Carolina. I think it came out maybe 20 years ago, but uh, it's uh, pretty good. Um, you know, all these, there's so many ships. And uh, so I always use uh, Paul Silverstone's uh, Civil War Navies that gives me more information than I want to know <laughs> about these various ships. And uh, I think, um, I, I think there is a, a singular book on the Burnside Expedition. 
Uh, I have not read it, so I cannot recommend it. I've read all those other books, so I can recommend them. Uh, so the Navy um, uh, played a huge role in this, of course. Um, it's the mobility they offered that uh, was a key stone to McClellan's uh, um, tactics and strategy. So it's a great expression of having fluid motion um, interdicting your force in betwixt major forces of the enemy, uh, breaking their transportation systems, uh, taking away their ability to wage war by taking away their food supplies, their uh, other military supplies that they needed. Well, thank you, John. That that was fabulous and uh, many great comments. And I thank you so I, much. I learned learned about sideburns. That was my favorite. <laughs> um, we'll see we'll hope to see you all back with us on the 23rd of april and have a wonderful weekend and thanks again for joining us sink before bye. surrender exactly <laughs> bye thank you